Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise, Hallelujah. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we're going to move swiftly through the 10 plagues. And there's two things that are very significant that we need to remember. First of all, we need to look for the symbolism in this story. In other words, Egypt, just as it was a time of bondage for the people of Israel, so it represents the bondage that we are in before we come to know the Lord Jesus. And Pharaoh, being the king of Egypt, illustrates to us the old taskmaster that we had, which of course would be Satan. And we, as the people of God, when we come out from bondage or Egypt, it is to mean a permanent exit from that life of bondage. We are no longer under the old taskmaster. We are now learning to trust in God who is going to lead us to the promised land just as he did the people of Israel in Moses' day. And even though there is much difficulty and hardship in our time of wandering, in our time of journeying on our way to the promised land, the promised land is our hope, that is our goal, and that is to be our ultimate reward. And so keep that in mind as we read the story of Moses because there is much spiritual significance to our lives today that we can gain from and learn from their lives of yesterday. The second thing that I want to point out as we actually move into the story of the plagues is that we must remember God is going to prove himself the almighty God, that all gods who have come after him surrender to his power his authority, and his might. And so each of these plagues represent a direct attack against one of the gods of Egypt. And as I have pointed out in the past, they had many gods, literally hundreds of gods. And God is going to prove himself almighty as when he begins these plagues in Egypt, nothing can stop them, no sorcerer, no magician, No God with a little g, only the Almighty himself can bring an end to each of the plagues as he pours them out upon Egypt. And it is for this reason that you will see later, when the children of Israel leave Egypt, many of the Egyptians leave with them because they now realize that the God whom the Hebrew people serve is the true and living Almighty God. And they don't want to spend their days in vanity worshiping these little gods of Egypt when they have the opportunity to live for and serve and surrender to the true and mighty God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. But it's going to be these 10 plagues that prove that fact to them. And that's where we pick up today in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 8. Now it says, The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, and he said, Tell Aaron to take thy rod, cast it before Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. And so Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did as the Lord had commanded. Now Aaron cast down Moses' rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But notice, Pharaoh also called his wise men, his sorcerers, the magicians of Egypt, and they did the same miraculous act. And they did so with their enchantments. Every man cast down his rod, and they also became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And this is a show unto Pharaoh, his people in all of Egypt, that God is the mightier God. But God hardened Pharaoh's heart, 
so that he did not hearken unto Moses, because it must needs be that the ten plagues take place in order for God to prove himself among all the people. Now keep in mind, each of these ten plagues represent a direct attack against one of the gods of the people of Egypt. And so, of course, they worshipped a god over the Nile River. And therefore, God turns the water into blood. But if you'll notice in chapter 7, verse 22, the magicians of Egypt did the same thing with their enchantments. And so Pharaoh, seeing his gods at least equal with the Almighty, with Yahweh, doesn't surrender unto God. But in verse 23, he turned and went into his house. Well, chapter 8 begins with the plague of frogs. And verse 3 says that the frogs will be so severe upon the land, they will go up and come into your house. They will come into your bedchamber. They will be in your bed. They will be in your ovens. They will be in your kneading troughs. But again, in verse 7, it says the magicians also did so with their enchantments. And notice how even though the sorcerers can mimic the acts of God, they cannot stay, they cannot stop the hand of God. It is God alone who is able to stop each plague and begin another. Well, in verse 16 of chapter 8, now we see the plague of lice. And in verse 18, it says, the magicians attempted to do also, but this time they could not. So they said in verse 19, this truly is the finger of God, of the Almighty. Yet Pharaoh refused to hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Now in verse 20, we see the plague of flies upon the land of Egypt. In chapter 9, we see the fifth plague, the death of the Egyptian cattle. And in verse 6 of that chapter, it says that although all the cattle of Egypt died, not one of the cattle of the children of Israel died, no, not one. In verse 8 of chapter 9, we see the plague of boils. And in verse 11, it says the magicians, the sorcerers of Pharaoh, could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For being upon all the people of Egypt, it was also upon those magicians, upon those sorcerers. In verse 13, we see the seventh plague of hell and fire. And notice in verse 14, God is reminding them of his true intent. He says, I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, upon thy servants, upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth, that your Egyptian gods are no match for my power. And so in verse 15, I will stretch out my hand, I will smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. For this cause have I raised thee up, Moses, to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Not just among the people of Israel, but throughout all the earth. All people will know that God is the mighty God. He is the only true living God. And if men will turn from the hardness of their hearts and receive and accept that truth, regardless of what nation, people, or tribe they are from, they will, even at this time, be welcomed into the family of God. And in verse 23, it says, Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hell, and the fire ran along upon the ground. And the Lord rained hell upon the land of Egypt. There was hell, and fire mingled with hell. But notice in verse 26, where the children of Israel were, there was no hell. Now, as much as the Egyptians have already been plagued, they can't help but notice that what is coming upon them, the judgment of God, is not being poured out upon the people of Israel. They are free from these plagues. And we're going to see this in the future too. When God rains down his judgment once again against the people of this earth, those who defile his name and live in opposition to his will, 
the true people of God in that time, even then will be protected from his hand of wrath. Well, Pharaoh in verse 27, seeing the destruction of his nation, his kingdom calls Moses and Aaron and says, I've sinned. The Lord is righteous and my people and I are wicked. Entreat your God, bid him to stop these plagues upon me and my people, and I will let you have whatever you want. Yet even though he says this in verse 35, it says again, the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he would not let the people of Israel go. So chapter 10 begins with the plague of locusts. And notice what Moses says to Pharaoh in verse 3. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before the Lord? And there's a lesson for us to learn here, friends, because sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, God allows hardship into our lives to humble us, to bring us to a place of surrender. And many of us are just like Pharaoh. We don't learn from the first hardship, the second hardship, the fifth hardship. Some of us, it takes many hardships to get us to humble ourselves. But God's intention is for us to humble ourselves before him. Well, in verse 7, even Pharaoh's servants are saying unto him now, how long will you continue in not letting the people go? Are you waiting for all of Egypt to be destroyed? And yet, as we see in verse 20, again, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so he would not let the children of Israel go. Well, in verse 21, we see the beginning of the plague of darkness, which is the ninth plague upon Egypt. And it says in verse 21 that the darkness will be so thick that it will be felt. But in verse 23, as we have seen from previous plagues, the children of Israel escaped these plagues. They had light in their dwellings. Now stop and imagine that for a moment. You're in Egypt and the darkness is so thick, you can feel it. Well, obviously any light would stand out to you. And you can look just beyond Egypt over to where the children of Israel are occupying and you can see that they are in the light. Surely they must be coming to realize that God is the true and living God. And as we read, even though many of the people are seeing this truth, because God is hardening Pharaoh's heart for a specific purpose, Pharaoh doesn't see this truth yet. And that's what we read in verse 27. Again, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the people go. Now, at this point, you might be asking, why does God continue to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. Well, remember, the original request was to go into the wilderness for three days and then to return. And God is bringing Pharaoh to a place where three days is no longer important. When the people leave in Pharaoh's mind and for all the Egyptians, they are leaving permanently, never to return. But at this point, if Pharaoh were going to let them go, it would only be for a short leave. And so God is going to make Pharaoh hate the people of Israel to such a degree that he literally forces them out of Egypt and tells them never to return again. Well, now we come to the very last plague, which begins in chapter 11. And this is where the act of the Passover will become an institution for the people of Israel, because as each of the firstborn have been killed throughout all of Egypt, the firstborn of everything breathing, animal and human, as the people of God are saved from this death angel, they will commemorate this through the Passover festival throughout all their generations in celebration that God kept them from his hand of wrath. And the Passover is to be a sacrifice unto the Lord for his mercy. And we know, of course, that Jesus is the final and the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate and final Passover meal. Well, chapter 12, verse 1 begins by saying, The Lord spake unto Moses, and he says, This month will be unto you the beginning of months. It will be the first month of the year to you. Now speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, 
you will take every man a lamb, and that lamb is to be without blemish. Remember, Jesus was without sin. He was without blemish. The lamb shall also be a male of the first year. In the evening, they shall sacrifice it, and they shall take of the blood and put it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house. Now, if you were to draw this out, you would see that it would be symbolical of a cross. And one thing I would like to add here, that if you would do further research on your own, you will find the exact times that Jesus was being tried, was being persecuted, was being sacrificed and killed, is the same exact time the high priest was in the temple performing these acts according to the Passover festival. What continues in verse 8 and says, They will eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. And God says you will do this in remembrance of what I am about to do, because in verse 12, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt tonight, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. Notice that, because again, this is the direct attack against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment against them, says the Lord. And the blood that you have on your doorpost will be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see that blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. Just as the blood of Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, cleanses us and protects us from God's wrath, friends. His blood covers us from God's fury. And God says in verse 24, You will observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and thy sons forever. And in verse 27, The people bowed their head and worshipped Yahweh. And they each went unto their own houses and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord did as he said. He smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose in the middle of the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great sorrow in Egypt, for there was not a single house where there was not one dead. And that's where we're going to close today, friends. And I think the greatest thing that we can take from this story, hallelujah, is the fact that as the people of God, we are going to be saved from the wrath of God. If we are alive during the time that God pours his wrath upon earth, we shall be saved from that wrath. When we read in the book of Revelation that many frightening things are going to take place upon the earth, it says the people of God will be marked with a seal on their forehead and they will be protected during that time of great devastation. But even when we leave this life, when we leave this dimension and we stand in the spiritual dimension, the blood of Jesus is going to cover us from the wrath that all those who have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, the work and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and his blood as a covering, we will be protected from the wrath that they're going to endure. And so I want us to leave our time together this morning with our minds centered upon the fact of the hope that we have in Jesus. And this should cause us to want to celebrate and praise throughout the remainder of this day of not only what Jesus is doing for us, but what he has done for us and what he will do for us. And so let our hearts be lifted in praise today as we celebrate the triumph the victory, the power, and the might of our great King, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, friends, I love you. I'm so grateful that you're again with us. I pray that your journey will be blessed today. I pray that your spirit will be quickened and that your eyes will be enlightened. 
to all the truth that God has made available to you through and in his word. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.